Welcome back. This is Inside Exec and I'm Kim Bailey. The podcast that you're about to listen to is the first of three parts of a conversation Fuliana and I had with Triska Scott Brannigan. We were in a very noisy location during the conversation. We have as much as possible removed the background noise, but you will need to adjust your volume a little bit during this recording. Let's get on with it. She's Juliana Osborne and this is Inside Exec. Today we're delighted to have with us Triska Scott Brannigan and we appreciate the time that she has given to talk with us today about all things marketing. You came very highly recommended and we heard so much about you so I'm sure our listeners will really enjoy hearing this conversation. Just a little bit for our listeners about your background and please jump in anytime. Triska is ranked number seven most innovative CMOs by the CMO Council. That's fantastic. Not not easy thing to achieve, and we'll talk yeah. about that more. And at the moment, you are in education yes. at Deakin University, That's and you've right. got 70 people. You're leading them into the world of marketing and business development. That's right. I know you're going well because the numbers show that a um, lot more students are going to Deakin, and also the fact that we all heard of Deakin University. Well, that's great, then our, our jobs are, are done and it's good to know it's working. But yeah, there's a lot of growth that's going on with Deacon, mainly on the online learning side of yes. things. In a highly competitive, highly intensive yes. sector, I think it's really woken up and commercialised itself over the last few years. Yes. So it's an exciting time to be part of that. Excellent. And before that, Triska, you were about 20 years in the finance professional services with Deloitte, not just in Sydney, Australia, or in Melbourne, but also in New York. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, we want to hear about that too. Fabulous <laughs> years in Manhattan where I had all yeah. my children. And the other big chunk, which again we are very interested in, is your participation on the boards. You're yeah. on a number of boards. And I know that's important for everyone, but particularly for women to be on board. We'll come back to that. So is that a fair summary? I think that's a great place to start. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, tell us about your journey into marketing. What made you choose there or business development? Well, I started my career into marketing about my mid-20s. Mm-hmm. At the time, I had fell into business development. Mm-hmm. I say I fell into because I actually did an arts degree at university right, and right. I thought that I was going to go into HR and human resources. Right. But while I was doing my undergraduate studies, I worked you know, up to five jobs at one time mm-hmm. and I felt that I was more enticed to working than sometimes to study. Right. So I had lots of different jobs on the go. Not so I didn't study really Hard because mm-hmm. I did, and I made sure I got some good marks right. too. But while the type of jobs that I did while I was studying, they ended up being in roles that were more sales oriented. And so my very first proper job was in a car dealership right. as a business manager. So a business manager is the person that takes your money mm-hmm. when you buy the car, yes. tries to sell you insurance, warranty, extended warranty and wants to do your finance for you so that you borrow the money from the dealership. When I started in that role, I was 20 years old. I was the youngest person who had ever been in that seat and the only female who had ever been in that seat. Oh, well done you. I had an amazing education there. The, mm-hmm. It was like the University of Life training while I was mm-hmm. in that role. So I did university part-time while I, while I worked mm-hmm. full-time in this dealership for a, a few years. Mm-hmm. And that was a really great training ground for me. From there, I realized I had a, a knack for yes. sales, had a knack for focused on revenue growth, and so I moved into business development roles. And in a business development role, it's more working business to business, forming mm-hmm. partnerships, forming alliances between two companies and saying, how can we make more business together? Yes. How can we create a product together? Someone will have a customer base and the other one will have a product to sell into that customer base. Mm-hmm. And so I had a lot of fun doing that. But what I found was sales is very much a one-to-one relationship. Yes. And 
I was getting impatient that it was taking so long to see the revenue growth yeah. through a one-to-one -one relationship arrangement. And that's when my interest started to be in marketing because I saw that marketing was a one-to-many relationship. Right. So I could get greater growth if I could figure mm -hmm. out how to scale the conversations I was having individually, but at mass. Mm -hmm. And that's why my mid-20s, I took myself back to university. I was still working full-time, mm -hmm. so I studied part-time and it took me, I think, about three years to finish my postgraduate studies in marketing. And then the journey began, finding an organisation who was going to be willing to give me a shot, to give me a first chance yes. in marketing. Everybody mm -hmm. wanted to put me into business development, right. but I wanted marketing. And that, that took a little while to, mm -hmm. to crack. Is that when you joined Deloitte? No. So oh. that was, I, I was in insurance at the time, right. and that's when I moved from Sydney to Melbourne. I think that's right. a theme in my career. I, okay. I moved. I yeah. move where the opportunity is. Good. So I was based in Sydney, grew up yeah. in Sydney, and really wanted to move into marketing. I was looking at all the different opportunities in Sydney, yes. but everyone kept on wanting to put me into that square peg of, no, go in, back into business mm -hmm. development, go into account management. And that's fine, and they're all willing to pay me more money, but that wasn't what yes. I wanted to do. I was really curious and interested yeah. about this world of marketing. And finally, an opportunity came. It took about five, six months of perseverance, and an opportunity came to move to an organisation based in Melbourne in insurance. Mm -hmm. And I decided to pack up, mm -hmm. move to Melbourne. Didn't know I was sold there at the time, but I was excited about the opportunity because the opportunity was a blend of marketing and business development. Right. So they loved the fact that I had the business development side, mm -hmm. were willing to give me a break and let me start on the marketing side. And that's yes. where I really cut my teeth in marketing. I'm interested in the personal development side of things. You obviously were comfortable in developing the things that you were interested in and pursuing that. Now that you're in a management role, do you see people that you can identify that are doing the same thing? So people who are also equally, oh, I see it a lot. I mm. see, I think that the people who are really engaged in what they're doing, there is this wave of curiosity, this wave of appetite for growth and personal development. The people who really want to aspire to greater challenges mm. and different challenges. I am delighted to see that, particularly my the staff mm -hmm. that I have. Yeah. So I see that the staff I have, I see the people that I mentor outside of work, and but I just see this thirst to gain knowledge, mm -hmm. to apply the knowledge, and to really become the best that they can be. We get sold the idea that things are not as creative or as innovative as they used to be. The, the, the great age of marketing has passed, yeah. and mm -hmm. to hear that someone who is deeply involved in what it is happening today can see that there is still the age of marketing is definitely not past. Marketing has been completely disrupted in the last five years. It is unrecognisable. Mm -hmm. I have people, that was my next question, is what changes yeah, have you seen? Tremendous. So what has happened is the whole world has been disrupted through digital. Mm -hmm. yes. Not just sectors, but professions too. Mm -hmm. What is happening is because the World Wide Web came into being, what, 15 or so years ago, that was transformational, but it took a while for organisations to see this marketing tool. It is absolutely marketing tool. A website is like your retail shop mm -hmm. for your business, and you'll see some of the biggest retailers around the world will invest more money in redeveloping and building their web website mm -hmm. than they will in opening a flagship retail store. So that is a reality. Now, with the website comes growth in marketing technology, so what we call MarTech. MarTech is where um, technology companies have built different software systems that allow us to engage more directly with the end customer, to both engage with them and help them in their journey of using your product or your service, but also in identifying potential future customers and using it as a lead generation, lead nurture, lead, lead conversion tool. So there's over 3,600 marketing technologies out there in the market today. You do not need 3,600 <laughs> technology <laughs> solutions in one organization, but you do yeah. need a handful. Mm -hmm. And it's what we call a MarTech stack. Mm -hmm. So you stack all the products that you need. You make sure there's an open API system between each of the technologies. You ensure there's thorough data flow between them. And that is then how you build your MarTech stack 
to engage with your customer to ensure that they're delighted by the experience and to make sure they can come back and bring others. From the client point of view or customer point of view, now we love to because we've got a lot more information at our fingertips. We're able to compare and make choices. And by what you described, it's, it's enabled us to make a relationship, even though through technology, and to say, I like dealing with that, it was easy to make, the process was easy, it was friendly, I like the result, and I can recommend. Yeah, and when you think about education, a, a university a, is an option for people, it's a big decision for them to make. It's yes. going to be their second or third biggest purchase decision in their entire life. It will take them between one to two years to make that purchase decision. And as a university, I'm only open for business two or three times a year when mm -hmm. we're taking a new student. So our ability to engage with people through that decision-making journey is so critically important. I don't have enough physical arms and legs for people to go out and have one-on-one -on -one conversations all the time. Because if you think about just the first intake period of the year, our biggest intake, we have over 16,000 new students coming that year in that one intake. That's a lot of people to have conversations with. But what we do know from the research that we've done with in the marketplace is a lot of students, prospective students, they go onto a university's website to investigate what the options are, what courses are on offer, when it's available, how much will it cost, how is the um, course constructed, all those very relevant, important questions to have answered before you can make a decision. And we know that the experience someone has on our website when they're investigating what they're going to do, that customer associates the experience on our website during their research with the experience they will have when they're actually being taught mm -hmm. at the university. So they're not taught on our website. They're taught in lecture theatres. They're taught on our online learning platform. Mm -hmm. It's completely a totally different system. Right. But the psychology of the consumer is, mm -hmm. I go into your website, yes. have a beautiful, elegant, easy experience. It's frictionless. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when I'm learning, beautiful, elegant, yes. frictionless learning experience. And yes. that's, the, that's what we need to create for them. In mm -hmm. both environments, right. it's really interesting that they only put the weight of their experience on the website because they can't right. experience learning with us no. until they've paid until us they their money. Yes. <laughs> so yes. it's a it's a big leap of faith, yes. and that's why it's so important to have a really yes. strong website. It's, it's akin great. to the idea that with any online experience, particularly with the services mm -hmm. area, that you give them something of value before you ask for their money. Yes, so that you're that in that experience, you're giving them something of value to them that reassures them that they can trust you, that they like you, that they know you, and they can then make the, their buying decision. And, and this has been the foray of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, which has really yeah. been taking over the marketplace in the last few years. Mm -hmm. And you can now do a MOOC, an online free course, with Harvard, with Oxford, with, mm -hmm. with Deacon. And this is, gives you a little taste here. Yeah. It's typically two weeks, so it's your intensive <laughs> program. Uh, you learn through the program at the pace it sets or at your own pace. Thousands of people around the world are doing it at the same time with you. Yes. So there's a lot of interaction if it's managed well. And it's for free. Yeah. And we're giving you the best minds, the best academic mm -hmm. minds in a deep subject matter area that is of interest to you personally. Yeah. And you can go and you can learn about that. Yeah. How wonderful is that? It brings up two points for me is that in terms of your competition in your in your business, that you now have competition worldwide, which you didn't have in the past, and that regardless of the country or the state's choice of whether students pay or not, is that there is an opportunity for education for everyone. At yes, to some yes. level, which is wonderful. It, it's yeah. it's all about access, equity, inclusion. Mm -hmm. Everyone should have the opportunity to be educated, and unfortunately, we're not there yet. So, in that sense, then, do you, as an organisation, identify your ideal client, your ideal student? Well, it's not about ideal. It's about trying to identify who has got the best opportunity to succeed. And sometimes the criteria that's put on by the government or by universities themselves aren't the right measurement. Mm -hmm. We have scores that we get when we finish yeah. our school certificate at yeah. the end of yeah. year 12, and each state calls it something different. In Victoria, we call it a VTAX score. In 
New South Wales, it's UAC. So it's different wherever you go. But the theory is, if you get a basic score, then you must be a you must have the learning acumen to be able to succeed in university. But we know that that is so skewed to your socioeconomic background. Yeah. Did you go to a private or public school? Were you regional or city based? Are you first in family or, or whole entire family being educated at university? These have a big profound impact on the school that you're going to get. Now, the government does realise that. And so universities are allowed to bonus people who are perceived as being disadvantaged through these things. The sector does go to, to the extent that it can to try and normalise it. Mm -hmm. But some people still, despite that attempt to normalise, still don't qualify based on their mark to get into university. Mm -hmm. The good news is that there are options for those people. It's what we call pathways. So you could go to TAFE, you could go to a college, and based on your success there, so long as you do a related course after the first year, you could then go back into the university system. And we look at the numbers very closely. For those people coming in through those pathway programs do better or worse than people who came direct. Right. The answer is it does not make a difference. Really? And I think the really exciting thing yeah. is that people have to go through a pathway yeah. and they really want to get to university. You find they're often the harder work. They yes. know that it's a privileged position yeah. to be able to get this education. It means so much to them. They're trying to break the mould in their life. They're trying to make yeah. a difference and set themselves up for a fantastic life. Mm -hmm. And, and they then, it puts much more meaning into their education. Yes. Their focus. That be very true for overseas people. So people that come from overseas, done their schooling overseas, they come and use the pathway to get to university. They will give it everything and then yes. get in and do well. Yes. yes. The difference yeah, there, great. of course, is they have to pay a lot of money as yeah. a result to get in. Yes. So therefore it's only the privileged people overseas who can afford to do it. So again, we don't have full equity and inclusion. Uh, across the world, yeah. globally, yes. No. I, I was thinking more about migration, people that migrate yes. here and they citizens of the country and then, again, they got to go through a pathway. I certainly had to do that. And that makes a difference because you kind of accept the fact that you need certain qualifications to do something and you're determined, so you go and make it happen. And sometimes those people are well supported yes. by their families and sometimes they're not understood so it's because it's first in family and yeah. the parents or the wider community just don't understand why. We're going to take a break in our conversation with Triska Scott Brannigan, so join us again for part two. I'm Kim Bailey, she's Juliana Osborne and this is Inside Exec.